So, uh, last time we talked, we defined or we're reviewing how we define sine, cosine, and tangent inside of a right triangle. So we talked about Sokotoa. We did some examples of finding exact values of uh, these trig ratios using a right triangle. Um, there are some values of theta that I can expect you guys to be able to give me the exact values for um, without giving you the um, without giving you the triangle. So for example, So this is enough information for us to answer and find the exact values for all six trig functions. All we need to know is that the angle measure is 60 degrees. Why is that enough information? So if this is a 30-60-90 triangle, I know that the side lengths of a 30-60-90 triangle exist in a specific set of ratios. So the way that I memorize this is that the square root 3, 1 always goes on the leg next to the 30 degree angle. That's the way I remember it. Hypotenuse is always the 2x because 2 is longer than square root 3. Everybody okay with that? You remember this 30, 60, 90 triangle from geometry? It was a long time ago. So if you don't remember it, that's okay. This is the ratios. Do I expect you to remember it from here on forward? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so for sine theta, what do we, or I, sh, I probably should have wrote 60 here, but sine 60, what do I get? Opposite is x square root 3, hypotenuse is 2x, so that reduces down to square root 3 over 2. Cosine would be x over 2x, which reduces down to a half. And cotangent would be x square root 3 over x, which reduces down to square root 3. So the cosecant is going to be the reciprocal of sine, but I have to rationalize the denominator there. Secant would be the reciprocal of cosine. Cotangent would be the reciprocal of tangent. But here I have to rationalize the denominator. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Jackson? for cosecant here, uh, 2 square root 3 over 3. You're welcome. Oh, this first part is just 2 over the square root of 3. My apologies. Is that too messy? That's a little neater. Um, the other, so we can do this for 60 degrees, right? We can find exact values with no triangle given. We can also do it for 30 degrees, right? Everybody's okay with that. Obviously, there's not anything different to doing that. You just have 
different opposites and adjacents. Everybody's okay there? The other angle measure that we can do this for, da 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 da, is if we have a 45 degree angle, because we know that if we have a 45 degree angle, what kind of right triangle are we talking about? 45, 45, 90. The side lengths of a 40, 45, 90 triangle are x, x, and then x square root 2. Again, hopefully you remember this from geometry, or at least recognize it as like, oh yeah, I remember that's a thing from geometry. If you don't still have these memorized, which is probably likely, you should remember to try to rememorize this. So again, if I wanted to do um, sine 45, cosine 45, tangent 45, uh, cosecant 45, secant 45, and cotangent 45, I can just do the same kind of thing, right? So I get x over x square root 2, which simplifies down to square root 2 over 2. I skipped some steps there. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, good. Somebody said yes. I'm going to take that as everybody says yes. Oh, really is right. So I did these so quickly because I looked at this and that's 1 over the square root of 2, which whose reciprocal is just the square root of 2. I didn't look at the rationalized answer to do the reciprocal because it just meant more reducing. I looked at the non-rationalized denominator answer to do the reciprocal, which means I don't have to do any reducing when I make the reciprocal. Just, I saw some people making some faces when I wrote those two down, like, well, that does not look like the reciprocal of square root 2 over 2, and that's why. So on that, that they actually cancel each other out? They do cancel each other out. So what the, why is the side not the Because I rationalized the denominator, but I didn't show the step. I just said oh. it aloud. Okay. So... If we're given the side lengths of a right triangle, we can find the exact values of all six trig functions. If we don't know the side lengths, but we're given a 30, 45, or 60 degree angle, we can find the exact values for the side or for the ratios. What do we do if we aren't given either? What if I just ask you to find sine of 17? How would I do that? Use your calculator is the correct answer. So when I use my calculator to do sine of 17, what do I need to make sure I do before I type this in? I don't need to graph it. What should I do before I type this in? Yeah. We got to check that mode. So let's press the mode button on our calculator. Make sure that we are in degree mode to do this problem. If you're not in degree mode, please change it. Uh, in this class, you're going to be using both degrees and radians, and you'll be doing this inside of the same test. So you're going to have to make sure you're being careful about switching back and forth when necessary. Caden. It should be right next to the second button. Okay. Uh, come show me. We'll find it here in a second. So you're in radian mode. I can see that there. How do I get up 
to there. Nope. You can scroll. <laughs> Just with the up and down arrows? It's like a mouse. <laughs> I do have to. So, can we get up there and try to grab where it says radiant? And see if you can just change it right there. No. Okay, let's try pressing menu. Nope, that doesn't look like it. Escape. That's just the uh, menu that looks like the index. It's not quite what I want. <laughs> nope, that doesn't look like what I want. <laughs> <laughs> ah, about the settings. <laughs> Sync connect to the internet. There we go. Document settings, radiant. Catch all that. No? Or yes? Okay. All right. And it's back to you. Now. You're welcome. All right. When I do sign 17, I get 0.293, yada, yada, yada. All right. Everybody happy with that? Okay. So, with that in mind, with now the graph and calculator, I can now. Solve things like this. <laughs> Stop talking, please. So we can now do problems like this, where it says solve the triangle. When I say solve the triangle, what does that really mean? What am I asking you to do? Find all the sides and all the angle measures, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's give this some names so I can, we can talk about it. So what's going to be the easiest thing to start finding here? Okay. So we're missing one angle for A. How do I find angle A? Good. 90 minus 41 will give me angle A, which is 49. Great. Now let's find one of the sides. Which side do you want to find first? X. Sounds good to me. So if I'm looking for X, that is the opposite side. The side I know is the adjacent side, and those are all relative to the angle that I know, which is 41. So the trig function I'm going to use to do this is going to be tangent, because that is opposite over adjacent. To solve for x, I'll multiply both sides by 12. So that's going to give me 10.43. 1, I guess. Rounding to three sixteenths. Or three decimal places. Everybody okay there? How can I find the third side? My side y. What was, what was that from the back? Pythagorean theorem will work. Is that the most accurate way to do it? No. Why is it going to be least less precise? To use the Pythagorean theorem, I'm going to use one rounded answer and then round it again. So there's going to be two phases of rounding and using the Pythagorean theorem. While if we're all we're rounding to is like one decimal place, probably fine. If you're trying to land a rocket on the moon, might be an issue. 
What would be better or more accurate is, again, if I'm using 41 degrees, I know the adjacent, and I'm looking for the hypotenuse, I can use cosine of 41, and now I've used only the given values, the exact given values to solve for y. So this answer will be a little bit more precise because I don't have any rounding involved. Um, so if I multiply both sides by y and then divide both sides by cosine of 41, I would get 12 divided by cosine 41, which is about 15.900. Just to illustrate the difference, if I tried to use the Pythagorean theorem for this, and I did 12 squared plus 10.431, squared, I get that. Now, if we're rounding to one decimal place, didn't make much of a difference. If you're trying to land on the moon, probably an issue. Okay, so there is a small difference. It's small, but depending on how precise you're trying to be, if you don't have to use a rounded answer, don't use a rounded answer. I prefer you guys to get in the habit of not using rounded answers inside of uh, the next step of a problem unless you absolutely have to. Okay? Again, I wouldn't mark it wrong unless I direction specifically made reference to like wanting the most accurate answer or something like that, a more precise answer. Okay. That closes up section two. Let's move on to section three. So in section two, it was largely just a review of the right triangle trigonometry skills that we had learned in our geometry class. Now I recognize your geometry class has been some time ago. So it might have been more than just a review. Um, but we're not going to focus on that type of trigonometry for very long because the goal of this class is to extend our definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent so we can use them in more than just right triangle situations. So the first thing that I want to talk about here in trying to extend our definition of sine, cosine, and tangent out is this idea of an angle of rotation. So those of you that are at least like familiar-ish with like skateboarding or snowboarding or one of these kind of sports have heard people talk about like a 540 where somebody jumps up in the air and spins around one and a half times. Now in our geometric setting if I tried to draw a 540 degree angle is that possible? No, right? We want to be able to use sine, cosine, and tangent on things like 540 degree angles because if you have a, something that's rotating, certainly something could be turning 540 degrees, right? If you have like the, if the crankshaft of a car or something that's spinning, certainly that would be a very important to be able to measure that and do a computation using that angle. So the way that we're going to set up to do that, to deal with a 540 degree angle, is we're going to take the xy axis, and we're going to embed this angle inside the xy axis. We're going to fix one arm of our angle onto the positive y axis. We call this the initial side. And then we're going to rotate the other arm of our angle, pivoting at the origin, 540 degrees. So here to here is 90 degrees and 180, 270, 360, 450, 540. 
We call this arm of our angle the terminal side. Notice for this 540 degree angle, we rotated counterclockwise. Now, if we think back to that example of like the crankshaft of a car spinning, we could spin in one direction or the other direction, right? If you're in drive, it's spinning one way. If you're in reverse, it's going to spin the opposite direction. So we want to be able to account for that. We're going to refer to angles as being possible now to be negative and positive. And certainly a negative angle made no sense in a geometric setting. But describing this problem of the crankshaft of a car spinning either direction, we certainly need a way to denote one direction versus the other. We're going to do that by using positives and negatives. So again, we're going to start with that same initial side, but this time instead of rotating clock, counterclockwise, we're going to rotate clockwise. So 90, 180, 270, 360, negative 450, and then negative 540. So for a negative angle, we'll rotate clockwise. For positive angles, we're going to rotate counterclockwise. If we look at these two drawings that we made, are they really different? If I look at the drawing itself. No, the initial side and the terminal side are in the exact same locations, are they not? They are, right? The initial side is on the positive x-axis and the terminal side lies on the negative x-axis in both situations. So this is a very special situation when this happens. We have a definition for this. We call this situation coterminal angles. Yes, of course. So we say that coterminal angles are angles with different measures but have the same terminal side. So we observed above that 540 degrees and negative 540 degrees are coterminal, right? When we draw their picture, it looks identical. Do you suppose that an angle and the negative of that angle are always coterminal? Probably not. Let's look at an example to kind of illustrate that. So let's look at whether 45 and negative 45 are coterminal. So let's draw the picture. So our initial side is always the positive x-axis. And if I go counterclockwise 45 degrees, that's like to there. If I do the same thing for negative 45 degrees, we're going to go clockwise 45 degrees. And we can see the terminal sides are definitely not in the same location. Everybody notice this?
We think we understand the difference between coterminal and non-coterminal angles. Good. What we'd like to be able to do then is come up with a way to check whether an angle or whether two angles are coterminal or not. So the way that we can do this is with the following formula. So an angle coterminal to x is of the form x plus 360k, where k is an integer. When we say integer, we mean a positive or negative whole number. So again, that z-looking symbol is our symbol for the integers. So maybe we ask, are 47 and negative 1,393 coterminal? To do this, I'm going to ask, or I'm going to solve the equation, negative 1,900, I'm sorry, negative 1,393 equal to 47 plus 360k. And then I'm going to look at my solution to for k and see if I get an integer. If k is an integer, then yes, these two things were coterminal. If k is a decimal, then no, these two things are not coterminal. So I'll subtract 47 from both sides, divide both sides by 360. Do I get negative 4 there, I think? I guess I should check really quick. Yeah. And since that's an integer, that tells me that 47 and negative 1,393 are coterminal. What if I ask if pi over 4 and 21 pi over 4 are coterminal? Angela. Okay, which, which part? Are you talking about something in red or black? The first, this number here? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Is that better? Good. Yeah, if there's a situation where you can't read my penmanship, you did the right thing, you should stop me and ask. It, no, it's important that you can read what I'm writing. If I know my penmanship gets messy, stop talking, please, especially at the end of the day. So if you're having trouble reading something, please stop me and ask. It's okay to do that. It's important that you can read what's being written. Yeah. I do remember. All right. So if I look at these two angles, what do I notice right away? They're both in terms of pi, so that means they are measured in radians. So if I go back and I look at this formula that I just made, 
what would I have to do to adjust this so that my angle is, if my angle is in radians? I just need to change 360 into 2 pi. Okay with that idea? That's the only adjustment that needs to be made. Remember from last time that 180 degrees was equal to 1 pi. So 2 pi has to be 360 degrees. So I'm just going to see if 21 pi over 4 is equal to pi over 4 plus 2 pi k and solve for k. So if I subtract pi over 4 from both sides, I get 20 pi over 4 equals 2 pi k. Notice that 20 pi over 4 reduces to just 5 pi. And if I divide both sides by 2 pi, I get 2.5 is equal to k. Notice that that is not an integer, so I can say that pi over 4 and 21 pi over 4 are not coterminal. Everybody okay with that idea? What if I asked for two angles coterminal to pi over 3? How would I do that? So I'm just going to add or subtract some multiples of 2 pi. If the angle in question was in degrees, well, how would this change? Instead of using 2 pi, I would use 360. Did it matter that I added here? Could I have subtracted? Yeah. Did it have to be 2 pi as my first one, or could I have done like 7, pi, seven times 2 pi? Could still do 7 times 2 pi. It's still going to be coterminal. Right? There's infinitely many coterminals. You have lots of choices. Anything that's a multiple of 2 pi that you add to your original is going to be fine. Or subtract is fine. I usually pick two that are very small because it's computationally easier. Okay? All right. So, now that we've got a new definition for an angle, we can update our definitions for sine, cosine, and tangent. So we're going to start with the xy axis, And we're going to start with an angle embedded in that xy axis. I'm going to label some point P on the terminal side. Yes, Ben? That's new. Oh, this is four, sorry. Thank you. And I'm going to label this angle alpha. So the symbol for alpha is this like little Jesus fish. You need to pay more attention in religion class if you're like, how is that the Jesus fish? Yes. So that's just some point on the terminal side of our angle. I'm going to label that point P 
and gave it coordinates x, y. So I remember that our old definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent relied on a right triangle. If I look closely, if I draw a perpendicular line from that point P down to the x-axis, what I now have is a right triangle. Everybody see that? So if I look at this side of my right triangle, what is that length? What should I call that length? X. Very good. Notice that P is the point X, Y. So to get to P, I've gone X over. So that side must have length X. What is this side length going to be? It's going to be Y. To get to the point P, I went X over and then Y up. So that side should be, the vertical shot side should be Y. What would the length of this side then be? It's the square root of x squared plus y squared. How did I get that? It's the Pythagorean theorem, right? I have a right triangle with legs length of x and y. So that side length is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Since that's a bit of a mouthful, I'm just going to label that as r. So now, I can update my definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent, in terms of this new figure. So sine is opposite over, a J, or over hypotenuse, so that's going to be y over r. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, that's x over r. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, that's y over x. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so that's r over y. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so that's r over x. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so that's going to be x over y. Okay, there. So, what can we do with this? So, let's say we have the point negative 3, 4 that lies on the terminal side of some angle theta. And we want to find the six trig ratios for theta. So we want sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta, cosecant theta, secant theta, and cotangent theta. So if I use my new definition, sine theta is y, which is 4, over r. So remember, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So in this case, that's just 5. Cosine is x over r. Cotangent is y over x. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Secant is the reciprocal of tan or of cosine, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So notice what we've done here. We've changed our definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent. Instead of being tied to length, side lengths of a right triangle, are now tied to a point on the terminal side of our angle. As a result, you see that it's now possible to get negative values from sine, cosine, and tangent 
because our side lengths, or the ratio is no longer length related, they're locations on the xy coordinate plane. So we can now get negative values for sine, cosine, and tangent. We're going to stop here and pick up in section 4 when we meet again next. What I'd like for you guys to do for next time is to do 29 to 46. You guys already did the hard ones. The hard ones are those story problems.